There is a familiar hymn in the hymn book, um, 427. Yeah, I looked it up. 427, I have decided to follow Jesus. Who remembers that one? Huh? That's, that's a clappy song, right? right? I have decided to follow Jesus. No looking back, no looking back, right? That's, that's the key to that song. There's no looking back, no turning back, no, no nothing back. So you're making that commitment. That is a, a strong, strong commitment. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. And when you sing that, when you even just say that, think about the commitment that you're making. Think about the colossal commitment that you're making. You have decided that at this point, on this day, at, at this moment, I'm going this way, and I'm never going to look back. And there is a huge amount of kind of rosy optimism bound up in that. You, oh man, you're fixed. You have decided it. Usually it's after we've sung those songs and we are totally committed. We are sold out for the Lord. We're going this way and we're never, 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 never going to look back. And that is so good to hear. It is wonderful to see that in people's faces. It's wonderful to hear them say the words, especially new Christians, man, when they, you know, they, they come up out of the tub there and, oh, they are on fire for that. It's also a little scary because everything is safe in this room. Everything is safe amongst us as brothers and sisters in our fellowship. It's when we walk through those doors back there and we go outside, and the world begins to influence us. The world begins to, to work on our commitment to maybe to test our commitment a little bit, right? That's when it becomes a little more difficult. Everything is good and easy here. Everything is, we're 100% committed here. It's when we get out in the world that things become a bit more of a challenge. You know, the next verse to that song, though none go with me, I still will follow, right? Even if I'm all by myself, I will follow after Christ. No turning back, no turning back. That's a little different, isn't it? It's, it's no longer we anymore. It's no longer all of us together. I mean, if we all go as a column, that's one thing. But when you and I get through those doors and we find ourselves on our own, that's when we're at maximum testing. That's when we are, are, are seeing our commitment tested at one higher level there. That's when those words, I'm not turning back, I'm not going back, I'm not looking back. That's when those things are really tested. When I see that, when I, when I hear that song, when I... When we sing that, also always reminds me of, of Joshua. At the very last, the last little bit, he has assembled all of Israel. He's called witnesses against them. And he said, all right, we're going to go one way or the other. He says, you can go this way. You can follow after the gods of your fathers. And there's death there. You can go this way. You can follow after Yahweh and his leadership, and there's life there. Y'all remember what he says in 2415? As for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. That is a commitment, a decision, and we see that right away in the arc of the biblical story, that commitment is tested. Let's pray. Before we go on, Lord God, all of us have said these words. All of us have made this commitment. All of us this day have sung words of commitment to you. And yet we know that in the hour, as we depart and go back out into a hostile world, our commitment will be tested we want to live out Joshua's words. We want to say that no matter what, we will never turn back. No matter what comes our way, we will never look back. We will never turn back. 
It's up to the Holy Spirit to guide us, to show us the way, and to keep us walking forward, carrying our own cross towards the eternity in Christ. Father, make the words that I say be your words. Let none of my thoughts interfere with what you have to say to your people today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things you notice in this song and in the commitment in Joshua is that there's no gray area, there's no room left for exceptions, as in, uh, I won't turn back, you know, unless something startles me and I, and I want to look back, or there's, there's no turning back unless it just becomes too overwhelmingly difficult. There's no exceptions, there's no gray area, there's, there's, there's nothing that challenges our commitment. But if we're honest, and we're all honest in here, this is a safe place, we can all be honest here, there's a gulf, sometimes very tiny, sometimes very big. There is a chasm between what we say our commitment is and what our life displays our commitment to be, yes? We, we say, and all of us want to be 100% committed, uh, and then there's just this space, however wide you want to make it in your life, there's this space between what we say we are and what, what we really turn out to be. And usually we never intend to be that person. We never intend for that to happen. We never intend for those words to come out, those thoughts to come out, that behavior to shift. We don't intend for any of that to happen. We intend to be those Joshua 24, 15 people. Period, committed, going that way. But then something happens. Something happens and there, there becomes this difference between what we say we are and what we really are. And if we're not careful, that can break our heart. That can become something that consumes us. And believe me, the, the wicked one looks for that opportunity. If a little bit of doubt gets sown in our minds, if a little bit of doubt can take root up there, well, the wicked one will remind us over and over and over, see, you failed again, see, you failed again, see, you did it again. And pretty soon we start doubting that commitment. We say with our mouth, we're fully committed. We are 100% committed. But then our brain tells us, well, you said you're committed, but... What about this? And what about that? And what about that? And pretty soon that chasm gets a little bit wider. That crack opens up. And if we're not careful, we don't have any tools to bridge that over and to get back to following after Christ in the committed way that we said we would. Our passage today is going to contain three little events that all string together in short order. But at each one of these events, each one of these little pieces of the drama, you see the difference between what people say they are and what they really are. And you can see the disappointment that comes when you realize that what I said I am is not what I really am. So we're going to go back into Mark chapter 14, and we're going to see the way in which we can close this gap to keep it from getting bigger, first of all, but also the ways or the tools that God has given us in order to, to bridge this so that it doesn't become this fatal difference. We pick up in verse 27. Now, you remember, as, as Rick pointed out, that the Lord had just instituted the new Passover, the Lord's Supper, using the common elements of the Passover dinner. And so everybody is pretty much in a good mood. They're, they're, they're pretty excited. They're, they're marching back out to the Mount of Olives, singing a hymn. Probably, I have decided to follow Jesus. Don't quote me, I may not be correct, but they're singing a hymn that is taking them out. And then Jesus has to interject a little reality here. In verse 27, he says this. I, I don't know, I, I can't even imagine this. They're all happy. 
They're all excited. They've enjoyed the Passover supper. And as they're walking along, way up here, Jesus says, you will all fall away. Jesus told them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus is quoting Zechariah 13, 7. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now that's, that's in that short little interaction, 10 seconds of the interaction there. Jesus is pointing out the difference between who they are and who he is. What they are and what he is. He says, you guys are all going to fall away. Now, of course, none of them believes this. There is not a person in that group. Every one of them is going, come on, Jesus. Every one of them is convinced they're going to follow Jesus to the bitter end. And what does Jesus do? He pulls out scripture and he says, no, scripture says when the shepherd is struck down, all the sheep are going to scatter. Jesus himself being that shepherd in that, in that picture. And of course, his guys are all scattered. But here's who Jesus is. He says, but after I've risen, he says, you guys are all going to scatter. But after I've risen, I'll go ahead of you and I'll meet you again. Now, of course, they're not hearing any of this. And why aren't they hearing it? Because they're convinced it doesn't apply to them. They're convinced. He must be talking about somebody else, his other disciples. Those guys that didn't quite make the cut. That's, that's who he must be talking about. So old Peter pipes up. Oh, good old Peter. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. <laughs> it's hard when we know the story, isn't it? Peter, I mean, you can almost see him beating his chest when he says this. Even if all the rest of these guys fall away, not me, Lord, not me. Not a chance will that happen. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me. Look at that. Peter's not going to just wander away. Peter is not going to just abandon him. Peter, with his mouth is going to disown Jesus. Now, put yourself in Peter's shoes, in Peter's sandals. Make yourself Peter. You are 100% convinced, 105% convinced. You would never betray your Lord, right? Remember what Jesus said about the betrayer back here, okay? Jesus has identified him. Jesus has said the betrayer is going to... Now, Peter, he might be getting a little concerned here. So this, this voice that's coming up might be a little concern and bravado at the same time. And Jesus says, not only are you going to abandon me, you're going to disown me. You're going to tell people you don't even know me. I mean, Peter must have been deflated. Because look how he answers. Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same thing. Nobody, nobody wants to think that they will fail. None of us, none of us wants to think that under any circumstance, and just let it, let it sit in your mind for a second, under no circumstance would I ever disown or abandon my Lord. We're all convinced of that, every one of us, until the very next time that we sin. Until the very next time that we fall a little bit short and the wicked one starts to work. He starts to say, I, I, I thought you said you were committed. I thought you said you were a hundred. I thought you said even if you have to die, you would never disown your Lord. And yet look what you just said. Look what you just thought. Look what you just did. And that's when, that, that's when that crack opens up. We say, well, I want to be on that side of the crack, but we, we find ourselves 
over here, this difference between who we say we are and who we are. So with that, that downer of an interaction there, they're marching into the garden at Gethsemane. Now this garden is a walled off place. This is a private place. Jesus is intentionally going back there for the last time in order to control the situation. He's gone there often to pray. He's going to go back there because he knows, he knows that the betrayer and his enemies are only going to come from one direction. They're not going to catch anybody off guard. And so in his final hours here, Jesus is continuing to exercise not only spiritual but behavioral control over everything that's happening here. There are no accidents in this. So they went to a place called Gethsemane. So I'm in verse 32 now. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John, so the brain trust is all together. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Now, that's an interesting statement. Why is Jesus the least bit distressed and troubled? Well, because Jesus is showing who he is. Jesus is demonstrating in full, and Mark has made sure this is just the, the briefest mention so that we can't miss it. We cannot escape this. The fully God, fully man is the one who is here in the garden. Jesus is not a spirit. Jesus is not this unholy, magical creature walking through here. This is the man, Jesus, about to face the worst thing imaginable about, about to, to come up to that moment that you and I face where we're going to decide, are we going to go this way or that way? So it is the man, Jesus, who is distressed and deeply troubled. And, and if you read this in Greek, you, you, you get more of a sense of the agony that Jesus is feeling at this point. We always talk about Jesus marching with his face like plant toward, flint towards, towards cavalry. Well, the reality is, is the man Jesus is very concerned, is in agony about what he's about to face. So James, Peter, John are over here. Jesus in his agony is over here. And Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Not so much watch for the betrayer. The betrayer can only come into this garden one way. That's part of their assignment. But watch Jesus. And why does he want them to watch him? They want him to be watched. They want the disciples to watch Jesus so that... When their trouble comes, when their challenge, when the worst thing imaginable comes into their life, that they can go, oh, this is how my Lord handled it. This is how I will handle it. I mean, think about what Peter just said. Even if I have to die, I'll do it. And so this is, this is probably pointed at Peter mostly. Stay and watch. Watch how the Lord acts. So Jesus goes a little further into the garden. In verse 35, going a little further, he fell to the ground. Look at that. Jesus is not, Jesus is, is not just carefully laying. Jesus is throwing himself down on the ground in this agony. He fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Now, who's saying that? Well, that's the man, the fully man Jesus, praying if there's any other way for the Father's will to be fulfilled, if there is any other possible way, let it come right now. Take this cup from me. Take this agony from me. I am so distressed. I am so brokenhearted. I am so in agony. Father, take this away from me. And yet... Look at the next sentence that he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. So you have the perfect God-man. Yes, in his 
human sense, in his man sense, he is brokenhearted. He is in total agony. He can't hardly face what he's about to face. It is the worst thing he's ever imagined. And yet, the God side says, no matter what, even if I have to die, I will serve my father. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. So here's their Lord in agony. Here's the Lord that they have committed complete fealty to. Here is the Lord that they said they would follow to death, that they would never abandon him. Jesus comes back. I'm sure he's just drenched in sweat. His face is all screwed up in agony. And he comes back and there's his guys asleep. Simon. That's a bad sign, by the way. (laughs) If Jesus has stopped calling you the rock, something has happened. In fact, what he's saying, Simon, you're not who you thought you were. Simon, he says to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And then that line that we all know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Jesus is is not fooled by Peter's commitment. He knows Peter in his heart wants to be committed, but he also knows that Simon in the world is going to get challenged probably by a little girl, and he's going to abandon the Lord. He's going to completely disavow that he even knows the Lord. And so he's pointing out to Peter. He said, there's a space. There is this gap, Peter, between who you think you are You think you're the rock. You think you're Petros, the rock. You think you're that. But you're still Simon over here. You got to grow up, Peter. You got to close this gap between Simon and Peter. So, verse 39 once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And this is even sadder. They didn't know what to say to him. See, little by little, his guys are beginning to realize that what Jesus said to them about them abandoning him, there might be some glimmer of truth to this. They might actually abandon him. A little bit of doubt is starting to creep up. He's given them only one thing to do. Stand watch. Stand watch. Watch me. And yet they're sound asleep. Mark doesn't say it, but Jesus goes away another time. And he prays. And he comes back, returning the third time. He said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Bless you. Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us go. Here comes my betrayer. We'll never abandon you. We're fully committed to you, Jesus. Even if I have to die, I'll follow you no matter what. And Jesus comes back. And here's the three most important guys in his troop sound asleep. I mean, what hope is there for the rest of them? If the three leaders, the inner circle of his party there, cannot stay away, cannot watch after him, cannot follow after him, what hope is there for the rest of them? What hope is there for us? So Jesus kicks him awake again. He says, it's time. Now, these guys are going to vanish shortly. The disciples are going to be out of the picture. But you're left with this lingering thought, this difference between who they thought they were and who they actually were. 
When Jesus says, rise, get up, let's go. Well, those words, those words are testing their devotion. Now, these guys would rather put that off until tomorrow. They would rather sleep tonight. I mean, they're exhausted. I get it. They would rather go back to sleep. They would rather slumber. But Jesus says there's no time for slumbering. There's no time to do things on your schedule. We do things on God's schedule. So you got to be prepared. And so that's why we get this urgency in Mark's story. That's why all this is happening over the course of about 150 words. That's why Mark is pushing, pushing, pushing. And it reminds us that we don't have tomorrow. None of that is guaranteed to us. We don't always say or have the time to say, I'll get better tomorrow. I'll get stronger tomorrow. I'll, I'll fix my commitment tomorrow. I'll address my sin problem tomorrow. We don't always have that. I'm sure these guys would love 30 more minutes of sleep, right? Jesus, just give us a half hour more sleep. They would have liked to, to put off their prayer life for another day. It was, Jesus, you know, we'll do it, but we'll do it tomorrow. They probably would have liked to have a little discussion, a little Bible study over men's breakfast. But the plan of God does not move on their time or our time. The thought sometimes comes to us, doesn't it? I mean, you, you put yourself in this situation. James and John, the sons of thunder, and you in the garden. These kind of moments come into our life where this divide in our lives is laid bare. Where what we say we are, right, is much different from who we are end up being and it's tempting to do what the guys are doing here if we just had a few more minutes to get ready if we could just read a couple more pages of the bible if we could go to maybe just one more bible study then that gap would close up that would prevent me from failing in the in the, in the eyes of my lord all those things would be fixed But you've all heard enough of this Bible. You've all been in enough Bible studies. You've all been in Sunday school long enough. We've all sung these songs enough times to know that God's plan is going to roll on at his pace, at his speed, in the way that he deems it to be. And we need to take action. We need to take the opportunity to do whatever we can to close that gap between what we say we are and what we show the world that we are. That comes from a commitment to discipleship. It is prayer that bridges that gap. It is reading God's word and soaking it in that closes that gap. It is better fellowship, knowing that we all bear the image of God. We all bear the Spirit of God, a closer fellowship who can keep an eye on one another. It's all those things together. It's all those things together that begin to close that gap, that begin to give us the tools to bridge over that gap, to keep it close, to keep it close so that we never find ourselves slumbering when the Lord calls us into action. And listen, it's not something that we can put off until tomorrow. This is never something that we can say, well, I'll, I'll do that later. I'll, I'll do that next week. I'm really busy this week. No, you want to start it now. You want to do it now. This needs to be a regular part of your life because look, we're going to go back into this drama here and you can see that God's plan keeps moving along, keeps moving along no matter what failure comes into the picture. The final bit of this drama is the arrest of the Lord. Picking up in verse 43, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. So the Sanhedrin, remember, they were too scared to do this out in public. Now they have a nice private place 
to do their business here. So the Sanhedrin has sent this little army here along with the betrayer. Now the betrayer, look at, look at how his name goes from Judas to the betrayer. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Jesus said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And the men seized Jesus and arrested him. That betrayal is not just somebody talking behind Jesus' back now. It's not, you know, Judas standing behind the garden wall pointing at Jesus. He has been as intimate as he possibly can be with his Lord. And that's what makes it even worse. He has gone up and he is called the teacher. You're my Lord. Kissed him on the cheek. And that's when all that violence happens. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And then verse 47, then one of those standing near, we know who this is, right? One of them standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Good old Peter. Of course, Mark doesn't say it's Peter, and that's okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's a reaction rather than a heart action. The heart action would say, this is a part of God's plan. The Lord is letting himself be arrested. I understand this, and I know I say that all cool and collected. But that's what Jesus has been training them to realize and yet good old Peter, huh, Whew. cuts that poor Malchus's ear off. Jesus speaks once more. Now he's speaking to this little arresting force. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? And he's got to be looking at every one of them in the eye. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then everyone deserted him and fled. You get to these moments in scripture where it just arrests you. It just stops you cold. I mean, look at, look at how fast Mark has moved that along. And at every step, his guys stand over here and say, we're following you to death, man. They had Joshua 24, 15 tattooed on their arm right there. We're following you no matter what. We're not scared of anything. Until this little force shows up with their clubs and their swords. And they see their Lord being arrested. And they turn heel and run. You would never do that. Look at this little note that Mark puts at the end. It seems so out of place. It seems like Mark just had this random thought and he put it in here, starting in verse 51. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garden garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. I know, you're looking at me like, what does that have to do with anything? That is a picture, my friend, of being revealed for who you are. Now, no scripture says this, but tradition holds that this young man is John Mark, the author of this letter. And he was young and foolish and wanted to be one of the disciples, but he was not. He's too young, too inexperienced. But he says, I, I know where Jesus is. I'm going to go out. I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm going to do this. So quickly and so without thought that all he did was pull his robe over him. 
And you know what happens? He gets seized. They grab him. He keeps running, of course. They're holding his robe. And poor John Mark is toddling off. Well, let's just say naked. What we say we are and what we are should line up. That's our hope. That is the purpose of discipleship. That is why we pray. That is why we sing songs together. That's why we take the table together. That's why we have a time that we meet together to support one another, to hear one another's prayers, to be, to be convinced, to be, to be known, to, to, to be confident that somebody has our back. So that we can close that gap up between what we say and what we do. We should always take heart from passages like this. That gap between what we say and what we do can always be closed. And Jesus has shown us and given us the tools that we need to do so. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He's given us the ability to pray and be answered. All of these things close that gap up. All that's left is for you and I to devote ourselves to strengthening those tools. Scripture and prayer and fellowship. Those are the things that bring us together. Those are the things that test who we think we are. Those are the things that examine who we say we are. And then when we're all together, people can tell us how close we are to what we say we are. So read. Read God's word. Pray his word. And find a discipling relationship so that you cannot just be what you think you are so that all of us can be everything that we say we are. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.